Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. We have a better covenant upon better promises, and we have a better relationship with God. We were at such a desperate place that Andrew, it was like life. It was just life that was coming from the television. And every area in our life has been turned right side up. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach on prayer. And I tell you, this is near the end of my third week, and I have covered a lot of material. We've covered some things that I've not heard other people teach on these things. I'm sure they do, but I'm saying it's not being taught on near enough. And I spent nearly two weeks just basically trying to counter what prayer is not. And then this, this week, I've been talking about the real purpose of prayer. The prim primary purpose of prayer is just to have a relationship with God. And on our program yesterday, I was using John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I was sharing according to John 17, 3, that everlasting life is knowing God and Jesus Christ in an intimate, personal way. So put these together, and what you're saying is that the reason God sent His Son was so that we could have a close, intimate, personal relationship with Him, not just in the future in heaven, but right now. And I believe that this is what prayer is. Prayer is nothing but fellowship, relationship with the Lord. I think that religion has turned it too much into just words that we say, a monologue, people going through a prayer list. They have this track that they run on. And God may be wanting to draw you in one direction, but you are already headed over here. And I don't think that that's what prayer is. Prayer is just communion. You know, I go out with people. I meet people. And I may want to talk about something, but it's really dependent on what that other person wants too. We may be talking and they may have some need that takes me totally off of what I thought we were going to do and talk about. I'm reacting to that person and interacting with them. And I think that this is the way that prayer ought to be. Prayer is just communion with God and fellowship with God. And sad to say, I don't think that God gets very much fellowship out of most of our prayers. And that's not to say that there isn't a time for formal prayers. That's not to say that there's not a time for getting together and agreeing on things and praying as a group. That's not to say there isn't a time to take your authority and rebuke the devil. And that's not to say that there isn't a time to make a petition and request something or intercede for other people. But it is certainly not the full time that most people occupy prayer with those kind of things. And so that's what we've been talking about. In Psalms chapter 22... In verse 3, the scripture says, But thou art holy, O Lord, which inhabitest the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praises of His people. Now that is really significant. And over here in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, it says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in His love. He will joy over thee with singing. And if you look these words up in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, you look these words up, it means to dance violently, to twirl and dance. There was actually a time when we were first getting started that we met in this little uh, building in Seagaville, Texas. And the electricity had been cut off. We didn't even have any electricity. We met around uh, electrical spools with wine bottles and candles in the wine bottle. And, Anyway, we would sit around and worship the Lord for hours at a time. And Jamie, my wife, actually had an open vision and saw angels just dancing and singing over us. And you know, at the time, we didn't know this scripture. But as we studied the Word, we found this. And this is exactly what this scripture is describing, that the angels will dance and twirl violently over us. The point I'm trying to get across is that our praise... Our fellowship with God blesses God. And all too often, I think that most people's prayer life is all about their needs. They come before God and they just like, you know, in a sense, I don't mean this 
probably as bad as it sounds, but it's just like they come and they throw up on God. They just throw out all of their problems and talk about how bad everything is and gripe and complain. A friend of mine, you know, Charles Capps, uh, he's gone on to be with Jesus now, but uh, he said one time that he was praying and God just interrupted him right in the middle of his prayer and said, Charles, what are you doing? And he says, I'm praying. And God said, you aren't praying, you're complaining. And that's what a lot of people call prayer is just complaining. They just gripe and they talk about this and they, they don't minister to the Lord. They don't bless the Lord. But God inhabits the praises of His people. We were given specific instructions in the book of Psalms to enter His gates with thanksgiving, enter into His courts with praise, be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Prayer is about fellowshipping with God. It's about praising God. I think if we really understood all that God has done for us, man, we would just be much more full of praise. You know, people will make statements about, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about this and I'm going to ask Him why He did this and I'm going to ask this and I'm going to ask that. I don't believe it's going to be like that at all. I believe when you get to heaven and you see the glory of God, for one thing, all of the things that we obsessed about here on the earth are going to be shrunk down to where they just pale in comparison. The Bible says that the former things aren't even going to be mentioned or brought to mind. We are going to be so overwhelmed with the glory that God has given us. We're going to forget all of these little petty things that we had. And if there was a real problem, you're going to know all things, even as also you are known. You are going to know that God was better to you than what you deserve. And I believe that you're going to be standing there saying, oh, praise God that I didn't ask that stupid question. <laughs> Amen. We aren't going to be there. We, when we see the glory of God, I think that eternity is not going to be long enough to worship Him and thank Him for all He's done for us. I've heard people also say that, man, I think heaven, you know, it's going to be a boring place unless we're doing something. I believe God's going to give us jobs, that we're going to be ruling things, we're going to be conquering, we're going to be doing this, this, and this. Again, I don't think that people understand that once we get there and realize that we deserve to go to hell, I mean, the best one of us deserve to go to hell. None of us deserve salvation. And when we see and fully understand the price that Jesus paid for us and all that He's done, I think about 10 million years is just going to barely be sufficient for me to say thank you. I tell you, praise, if we understood all that God has done, praise would be a much larger part of our relationship. We need to be thankful people. Over in the book of Luke, the 10 lepers, Jesus went and they asked him to heal him, and he said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. And one of the lepers turned around and came back and gave thanks to Jesus. And he said, weren't there 10 cleansed? And there's only one that returned to give thanks. And because this man gave thanks, he was made whole. The others were healed, but he was made whole. That means if leprosy had destroyed some of his skin, or if he had lost any of his digits or any of those kind of things, they were just replaced. He wasn't just healed, he was made whole. And only one out of 10 returned to give thanks. Man, I don't wanna be like that. I wanna be the one that comes back and thanks the Lord. But there's so many people that in prayer, they are always going and asking for something, but then they don't return and they don't give thanks. I tell you, that's, God is, He's almighty. He is so complete. He is so strong. He is so mature that I don't believe he's sitting on his throne sucking his thumb because people don't give him thanks. But I do believe that that's what he desires. He desires to inhabit our praises. He wants to rejoice over us. God gets blessed when we say thank you. You know, just like our kids, you do something for them and often they just take it and they're gone. But boy, how does it bless you when your child just stops to say, thanks, dad, or thanks, mom. And, the, and you, they just show appreciation. Boy, it really ministers to you. Over in Acts chapter 13, in verse two, it lists all of these people, Paul and Silas were among them. And in verse two, it says, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. Notice it says that they ministered to the Lord. How do you minister to the Lord? Again, these words, we use them nearly exclusively in certain ways and we get our minds stuck in that mode. 
But you know, when most people think of ministry, they think like right now I'm ministering, I'm speaking the word, I'm telling you things, I'm trying to influence people and change people. And we are preaching to them, ministering to them. How do you minister to God? Were these people preaching to God, telling God to do something? As you read it, you know what they were doing? They were just worshiping God. And this is saying that worshiping God and thanking Him ministers to God. It blesses God. Psalms 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. For I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. So these scriptures and there's many others talk about bless the Lord. What does it mean to bless the Lord? You'll hear people in church going, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And they say those words that may or may not bless the Lord. It all depends what you mean in your heart. When you're talking about blessing the Lord, it's saying that when you are like that leper that returns and you say, thank you for healing me. When you just praise God for the beautiful day, when you praise God for what you've got, you know, I got out this morning before the sun was up and I, you know, I don't know why this happened, but I just, uh, when I turned on, when I opened up the garage door, a light came on and it was just totally dark and I didn't have to stumble over things. And I was saying, thank you, Jesus, for electricity. <laughs> I know that most people think stuff like this is stupid. They just take it for granted. But you know what? There was a time that you didn't have it. And I was just thanking God for the things we got. I got in the car and I was thanking God for a nice car with a heated seat. And I was thanking God for these things. And you know what? You just thank God for the way that He's blessed you and enabled you to do things. And when you do that, you know what that does? I believe it blesses God. I gave the example. I won't go into the whole story, but I did some special stuff with my kids and my youngest one as I put him to bed and I was walking out of the room uh, he said, Dad, and I said, yes. And he said, you're a good dad. And you know, when he said that, he blessed me. He didn't go bless you, Dad. It wasn't just repeating the words, but when he said, thank you, when he says, you're a good dad, thanks for taking me out and doing these things all day long, it blessed me. And brothers and sisters, I'm trying to get across that God loves you so much. He is just longing to hear you and me say thank you and to say, you're a good dad. You're a good God. Thank you for what you've done in my life. I know that some of you right now, you never allowed yourself to think that you and your thanksgiving or anything that you would do could really bless God. You just don't allow yourself to think that God loves you that much. But I'm saying this in the name of the Lord that I believe that God loves you so much that He inhabits your praise. He is dancing over you. Every time you just say, thank you, Father. Thank you for the sunrise. Thank you for the sunset. Thank you that things are as good as they are. Some people want to wait until there are no problems. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing on the horizon that looks wrong. Everything is perfect. And then they'll say thanks. Well, I tell you what, you aren't going to thank God very much because there's, we live in a fallen world and there's always something wrong. And if you don't have a problem right now, you will have soon. I mean, we live in a fallen world. Things go wrong, but they could be much, much worse. We need to learn to be thankful people. Second Timothy chapter three says that one of the signs of the last time is that people would be unthankful. And you know what? We need to break that cycle. We don't need to conform to the way everybody else is. We need to be thanking God and God longs for it. God longs for a relationship with you. And I know some of you think, I just can't believe that God cares about me that way. If he cared about you enough to die for you, to send his son and to die for you. Again, I go back to a verse I started with here in John three sixteen. God so loved the world. God so loved you and me that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life, have intimate, close, personal relationship with him. God loves you that much. God wants relationship with you like that. 
And I know that this is a brand new thought to some of you, and some of you, you've just never placed that value on yourself. But if Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice and gave His life for you, then that means that you are very valuable to Him. God loves you. He wants relationship with you. And we need to just spend time in the presence of God. And again, there's a place to request. There's a place to bind. There's a place to intercede, but it is not the main purpose. The main purpose of prayer is just to have a relationship with Him. And I would encourage you to spend much more time in just relational prayer. I don't know what the proper terminology to put on it is, but just in the presence of God, just thinking about Him. You know, one of the ways that I pray is I study the Word. And some people think, well, no, you're studying the Word. You aren't praying. But I pray the entire time. I'm studying the Word. And I am, like I read something, I'll read here about they ministered unto the Lord and I'll think ministered unto the Lord. And I'll think, God, what does that mean? They didn't sit a chair down. They weren't preaching at you. And as I'm thinking about all of this, I'm asking God to give me wisdom and to give me instruction. What does it mean to minister unto the Lord? I'm asking that question. And then the Lord will go to speaking back to me. He took me over to Matthew chapter 8 where it says that, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law and she arose and ministered unto them. It didn't mean that she preached at him, told him, Jesus, you should do this and this and this. She wasn't trying to explain scriptures to him. It's very obvious in Matthew chapter 8 that what she did was get up and probably cook food for him. She washed their feet. She did things that were customary that you did to people when they came into your home. And that was called ministry. It's a ministry. You know, just loving God, just serving God, just being there is a ministry. We need to minister unto the Lord. We need to bless the Lord. It's not all about us getting blessed. We need to give back. We need to thank Him. And again, I don't have a chapter and verse that says this, but my own personal life has developed to the point that I spend well over 90% of my time just thanking God, worshiping the Lord, and loving on Him and telling Him how much I appreciate Him. I spend another large portion of my prayer time. I mean, the next largest portion of my prayer time is probably spent saying, Father, what do you want me to do? And then if He shows me what He wants me to do, like I've talked about, He's shown me to raise up this Bible college, and I believe it's going to have a worldwide impact. It already is. And I believe it's going to make a major, major contribution to the body of Christ. And I'll see the vision and I'll say, God, how do I get there? What do you want me to do? I believe the Lord has shown me that we not only need to have the classrooms and stuff where we can teach the Word, but we need student housing. We need to be able to accommodate and help people so that they don't... You know, that's an obstacle, a barrier that stands in between a lot of people in coming to school is that they have to uproot, they have to go find their own place and accommodations in Woodland Park are not plentiful. We've nearly overwhelmed the town. And so it just make their experience so much easier if we had student housing. Then if we have student housing, we're also going to have to have, uh, you know, some facilities to be able to feed the people. They'll need exercise. They'll need places where they can get together and just study and have a library and look things up and read and spend some quiet time and on and on. And it just keeps developing. And so as God shows me these things that we need, I say, how do we get there? But the vast majority of my time is just worshiping God, loving God, thanking Him for what He's doing. If He's shown me something, I'll say, how do we get this done? Give me wisdom. And I believe I've already got it. It's just a matter of being still and drawing these things out. There are some times that problems will come up. When we first moved up to Woodland Park, I tried to be patient, but the uh, housing addition that was next to us did not want us in, and they did some really rotten things, in my opinion, and delayed us for two years, and I was patient, and every day I drove by that property, I'd speak my faith over it, and finally, I just said, that's it. I said, I, this has gone on long enough, and I rebuked the devil, and I said, I'm getting you out of the way, and if people are hindering this, they're going to be removed. Whatever it takes, this is over. That very week, we finally got the approval that we'd been after uh, for two years. Maybe I should have done it sooner. I don't know. But anyway, my point is that there are times that I will do things like that, but the vast majority of my time 
is just thanking God, worshiping God, listening for His direction, and then the direction He's given me, asking wisdom how to get it done. I'll pray for other people as God brings them to my mind. And I mean, there's supernatural things that have happened. I've had, I've been just praying and worshiping the Lord and somebody comes to my mind and I call them and I mean, it is the exact moment that they needed somebody to come into their life. And I wasn't, you know, doing anything weird or spooky. I was just fellowshipping with the Lord. And if you get into His presence and start listening, we're His sheep, we hear His voice and He'll speak to us and show us things. You know, if you can understand what I'm saying, this really breaks prayer down to where it's an enjoyable thing. The way that it's done sometimes where you've got to get in and you've got to scream and you've got to travail and you've got to groan and you've got to do all of these things. You know what? It's hard to do that. It's hard to maintain that over a prolonged period of time. And a lot of people, it just isn't practical. After a while, they quit doing that and then they become condemned because they've been taught that this is what prayer is all about. But you know, if you just understood its relationship with the Lord, it's loving God and having God show His love to you and receive direction and take the direction God gives you and speak it out and do things. And if that's what prayer was, man, I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to do that. Man, it's more enjoyable to pray and to fellowship with God than it is to watch people murder and kill and plunder and do all this stuff on television. But see, sometimes prayer has been presented as this thing that is abnormal. It is contrary. I believe it's just religious and people don't enjoy it. They get condemned over it and that's the reason they avoid it. I believe if you can understand the primary purpose of prayer is just to love and fellowship with God, that He wants your fellowship. And if you could receive that, it would change your whole attitude towards it. It'd be a lot easier to just pray and spend time with the Lord. One of the things that I enjoy, probably my most fun thing outside of just sitting and studying the Word is to get into the car and put on a praise tape and just go to worshiping God and drive for eight or 10 hours at a time. I love it. And I'll just worship God. And you know what that is? That's prayer. That's praise. And God inhabits the praises of His people. God loves it and I love it. And prayer is just about, the primary purpose is just about having a relationship with God. The reason I do what I do is twofold. First of all, God just transformed my life. And it's just like the guy that the Lord told him, he says, don't go tell anybody about what's happened to your daughter. And he, man, couldn't keep it quiet. When you get God touching you, you just want to tell somebody. You got this good news, you want to tell people. But beyond that, I believe God's got a specific call on my life. And I mean, God has encouraged me thousands of times. And on November the 4th, 2014, he woke me up at three o'clock in the morning and he said, this is the reason that I've raised you up is to change people's opinion of me. And as their opinion of me changes, then they in turn will go change their world. Our partners are essential to everything we do. 53% of the people who write us and contact us don't give a thing and we send them the material. And the reason that I give my tapes away is because back in the beginning of our ministry when we were in Seagoville, Texas, pastoring our first little church, I just made a promise. I said, God, if you ever show me something that could change another person's life, I'll never deny them access to it because of finances. The initial response that I get from people who come in contact with our ministry is that they just see God in a total different light than they've ever seen Him. That causes them to respond to God. The whole motive behind Charis is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where Paul said, Be strong in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus, and the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. That's been my whole thrust. And when I started Charis Bible College, it was because I could see that it was a way of fulfilling those verses. Through Karis, we go deeper with people than I can do on television or through a book or through a CD or anything like that. And so what we hope to accomplish is to make disciples. And it's already happening. We've got people on every continent of the world that are reaching people. And through them, we are making an impact that I could never do.
I'd like to invite you to join me for Karis Days. And this is a live stream event where you aren't coming to our Woodland Park campus, but instead you go to our website, you find the nearest campus to you, and you go to that campus and we will be live streaming there. You will be able to see what your local campus has looked like. Uh, you'll be able to meet with the staff there and to get a taste of it. And it's just gonna be a great event. We would like you to come and participate and find out if uh, Karis is something that God has for you to do. So check it out. The dates are on your screen, how you can contact us and check out your local Karis Bible College. Andrew's complete teaching titled, A Better Way to Pray, is available as a book in either English or Spanish. Today, Andrew would like to offer this book as his free gift to you. Go to awmi.net to get your copy today. I'd like to encourage you to get this free book that we're offering on prayer. I've got other product here, study guide, DVDs, CDs, but we're offering this book to you as our gift. And I tell you, this is a powerful teaching especially during this time, you know, we're just going through this um, virus that hit the world, actually a pandemic. And man, people are praying, but many times they're praying wrong out of desperation, begging God. They don't know the rights and privileges that God has given us. And I promise you, this would transform your prayer life. We're offering this as a free gift to you. So listen to our announcer as he gives you the details and please call or write today to receive our free book on a better way to pray. The individual topic highlighted on today's broadcast is available as an audio CD for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give because there's a blessing in giving. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide today's teaching free of charge. This is the last day we'll be offering this teaching, so be sure to respond today. A Better Way to Pray is also available as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast and as a companion study guide. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. This July 4th, join us for a rousing musical tale of heroism, hope, and sacrifice. Experience the key events of American history through the eyes of a single family. Coming soon with free admission to Karis Bible College, Colorado. In God We Trust, a fight for freedom. Do you want to connect with like-minded believers? then Karis Bible Studies is the place for you. Find a Bible study near you by visiting karisbiblestudies.net.